There we go. Uh, I'm going to be talking about pronouns. A lot of it focuses on English because that's the language that I'm working and uh, studying in. And I also wanted to mention that that this is joint work with some of my undergraduate collaborators, in particular, Vic Wen, L. Rose, and Max Winning, who are all undergraduate researchers at Swarthmore College in linguistics. So they all also use they, them pronouns, as in addition to uh, me using they, them pronouns. Um, yeah. Um, I am actually going to do the acknowledgments first before I get into actually uh, the meat of the talk, um, in part because the collaborations that have um, been part of sort of the work that I've done since moving to Swarthmore are absolutely the only reason that any of this work exists. So I want to give a particular shout out to um, my lab group called SEPTA, which stands for Scientific Explorations of Pronouns and Trans Acceptance. It is also our um, transit uh, authority um, in the Philadelphia area. So it's um, a fun joke for us um, that, and we've totally like stolen their logo to, to make it trans. Um, and, and we love that, but th this is a group of five linguistics labs in the greater Philadelphia area who are all focused on different aspects of pronouns and trans acceptance. Um, and so it's just been a really, really fantastic uh, way to start and continue a lot of collaborative research. And um, I also want to uh, shout out to my undergrad research collaborators, both uh, past and present. Um, this includes Jasper Nash, Kira Repke, L. Rose, Max Winnig, and Vic Wen. They are all very talented and fantastic linguists. And um, this is all work that has been in collaboration with them basically this whole time. Um, and then there's just also a lot of um, linguists that I want to shout out and um, also my cats. Um, and I'm doing that up front again, because none of this work would exist uh, without these collaborations and relationships here. Um, so uh, I want to just um, sort of lightly contextualize the context of the talk title. So um, I am sort of combining the concept of gender euphoria, which is like the opposite of gender dysphoria. So dysphoria is frequently described as a sense of wrongness or detachment or um, un unpleasantness um, and gender dysphoria is all of that related to gender presentation or gender identity and a mismatch there. Gender euphoria is a sense of rightness, belonging, pleasure, joy related to how your gender presentation is perceived by others and by yourself. And I think that this has been a really important concept for me as a trans person in general. And I think that it's something that I would like to see trans linguistics take up um, as a serious sort of source of why people are doing the language stuff that they're doing. Um, and then uh, a lot of this talk, I'm going to be talking about neo pronouns. These are neologistic or coined pronouns. They're often just coined uh, or formed by morphophonological analogy uh, with uh, existing pronouns. Um, and so in English, a lot of the neo pronouns that I'll be talking about, I don't actually know of any that are, that this isn't true for, um, but neopronouns are third person singular pronouns that are developed specifically for the purpose of adding gender neutral or gender expressive options to the existing set um, beyond he, she, and they. Um, and I wanna give a preview to some of the big ideas that I'm hoping to talk about um, during this talk. Um, First is that neopronouns in English are very, very low frequency. They don't come up in everyday conversation. And most people that I talk to have not heard of them um, or, or seen them used organically. The uh, place that people tend to encounter them is in lists of pronouns and information about pronouns, but not really seeing them used. This, this is just sort of uh, seems to be a fact. Uh, some of what this work is, is just sort of confirming that this is actually true because a lot of the information about neopronouns is kind of um, anecdotal. And so some of what I've been doing um, in the past year or so has been getting empirical evidence to confirm that people's impressions are correct, that these are very low frequency. But even though they're very low frequency, a lot of people find them pretty accessible, um, surprisingly so. And so that's some of the, the data that I'm hoping to show today. Um, and it's also the case that commentary about neopronouns from people who use neopronouns 
uh, talks about the sense of identity uh, expression and a feeling of rightness. Um, whereas commentary about neopronouns from people who don't use neopronouns tends to talk about how um, they're concerned with optimizing language, being efficient or solving the problem of non-binary language. And I think it's really important to think about these two different frames and why they are such different frames. Um, and I think that as linguists, we should be paying attention to joy and euphoria because it matters for how we study language and it also matters for what's going to happen next. So just a very vague outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I am in the process of um, either running or processing data from three studies on English neo pronouns. Um, the pilot survey and a follow-up survey are complete. I am now in the phase where I am working on the interview um, study. The pilot uh, survey was a large online acceptability judgment survey. I'll give you more about the methodology of that. And then the follow-up survey was the same, but uh, better methodology. Um, and then the interview survey is something that's a very, a very much a work in progress. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the methodology, but I don't have results to share yet. Um, I just sort of wanted to talk about it because I think that uh, it's important to contextualize what we know and what we don't know as linguists right now. So a little bit of background about English neopronouns. I'm going to go kind of quickly on this. Um, there are not that many previous studies on English neopronouns, and a lot of them tend to be pretty recent. Um, the least recent one, I'm actually doing these bullet points out of order, uh, is M. Milterton's uh, study on noun self pronouns. Uh, noun self pronouns are pronouns like when you take a noun, um, it's frequently a single syllable noun. So it could be like star or um, kit or something like this, and then use them as a pronoun. Uh, Milterson uh, was looking at how people felt about noun self pronouns. Um, and uh, what they found was that people really saw them as being tied to their personal identity, um, which is something that I'm going to be kind of following up on. Uh, the other sort of idea of like where neo pronouns come from is um, coming from Dennis Barron's 2020 book, um, which follows uh, sort of a historical corpus um, study of uh, discussion of neo-pronoun coinages, particularly in newspapers through the past like more than 100 years. And uh, what he says is that there's been a lot of attempts to coin neo-pronouns frequently for gender equity or for the attempt of gender neutrality, um, and sometimes for uh, specifically non-binary identities, but none of them really became mainstream. Sort of the conclusion of, of Barron's book is that they is becoming mainstream um, and that you'll see a lot more they, them pronouns, but that the neo-pronouns that people have been trying to coin for the past hundred years really haven't taken off and become part of um, what we would consider sort of hegemonically dominant English. Um, and then around the same time, Laura Hakanaho um, finished uh, their dissertation looking at sociolinguistic variation in um, neo pronouns. And this is the most similar to what I'm going to be talking about today um, looking at acceptability ratings of uh, neo pronouns and singular they. Um, and found that younger people, queerer people, um, and, and people who are more familiar with trans identities rate neopronouns as more acceptable, um, but still not as, as acceptable as singular they. Um, and then I, finally, I think that the important piece of context uh, that I want to take from the gender census, which is a 2021 study, it's, it's actually a, a periodic study, they do it every year or two, um, is that neopronouns are not um, uh, not a majority of trans people use neopronouns, but they do make up a pretty notable minority of trans and gender expansive people. The gender expense, uh, census is a, uh, a survey of just trans and non-binary people sort of umbrella. Um, so uh, the gender census is, is one of the ways that we decided which pronouns to include in our pilot survey. So I'm gonna talk about our pilot survey first. Um, we used um, four neo pronouns, Z with a Z, um, Z with an X, A, that's E-Y, and Fe, which is F-A-E. Um, 
and they are just not very widely used. Um, they were the four most commonly used um, neo pronouns according to the 2021 gender census, which is how we used them, uh, uh, how we decided to use them. And our main research questions were um, first, how do neo pronouns uh, compare in acceptability with canonical pronouns? Um, I'm calling canonical pronouns, anything like he, she, they, it, where it's not a coined pronoun. I'm calling them these because they are not like, the neo pronoun is, is um, sometimes sounds like it means new pronoun, but some neo pronouns are fairly old. Um, and uh, so uh, we also don't want to um, imply that like, I, I don't like the word paleo pronouns for he, she, or they, because like, the the relative age of the pronoun is not exactly the issue. So canonical pronouns is, is sort of what I'm using to contrast with neo pronouns. Um, so we're looking at comparable grammatical contexts um, and, and different antecedent types, and just looking at how do they compare with uh, sort of acceptability. And then uh, we wanted to look at some social variables. We wanted specifically to look at age, gender, gender orientation, meaning are people trans or cis, um, and then how many trans or non-binary acquaintances somebody has and whether those affect how people rate the acceptability of neopronouns as natural sounding and comprehensible. Um, and then we were also interested in comparing each neopronoun to each other. So which of these neopronouns is rated um, as sounding more natural? Um, and one of the things that we have been curious about from the start is whether this sort of morphophonological analogy is something that affects how highly the neo pronoun is rated. So for example, ZE is sort of analogous to HE, um, just orthographically and also phonologically. And so we're curious, okay, are Z, he and she analogous in such a way that that makes Z get rated higher than other neo pronouns. So we're gonna be comparing neo pronouns to canonical pronouns and also neo pronouns to each other. So um, the uh, stimuli for the pilot, um, we asked people to rate stuff on a Likert scale from one to seven, where one is completely unnatural and seven is completely natural. Um, this being a pilot, we did this without um, sort of fillers, um, but we do have some controls being grammatical and ungrammatical controls. Um, of the 54 stimuli, we have 24 sentences with neo pronouns. Um, 16 of those sentences are combinations of different antecedent types and uh, each of the four neo pronouns. So the four neo pronouns being Z, Z, A, and Fe. Um, the antecedent types, we had um, three different types of proper names, feminine proper names, neutral, gender neutral proper names, and masculine proper names. Um, and then we also combine them with definite NPs. So um, stuff like the attorney. So we had stuff like when the attorney looked up, Z made eye contact with the judge. Um, so that accounts for 16 uh, target sentences there. Then we had some ungrammatical controls. Um, so uh, for ungrammatical controls for the neo pronouns, we combined them with singular inanimate um, noun phrases. So this would be something like the teacup and plural animate noun phrases, something like here, our example, the circus clowns. Um, and so uh, our idea is that generally it's understood that uh, neo pronouns are singular, not plural. And so these should be rated as uh, lower um, and inanimates also theoretically should be rated as lower. Um, and then also as a uh, control, we combined all the antecedent conditions with uh, case error um, pronouns, uh, canonical pronouns. So um, there instead of they, um, and I believe we used him instead of he, uh, so that we had different kinds of case errors um, combined with all the types of the antecedents that we have included here. Um, and then as grammatical controls, we had 18 sentences with canonical pronouns. So this is um, he, she, and they combined with feminine, neutral, and masculine names, definite NPs, uh, which are grammatical, and singular inanimates like the teacup, which would be ungrammatical. So a uh, masculine name with he is Solomon promised he would bring some dessert to the party. So this is a lot of experimental conditions. So I'm going to try and kind of bundle them in a way that makes sense uh, when I move into talking about the results. Um, 
The social variables and ideological questions that we asked about included um, demographic questions and also some free response questions. Um, we asked about um, gender, age, sexual orientation, uh, people's race and ethnicities, what pronouns people used and what languages they were fluent in other than English. Um, we also had um, some free response questions where we asked basically for metalinguistic commentary. So we asked if you've heard of neo pronouns before, have you used neo pronouns? Um, what is your stance on singular they and do you have any thoughts? Um, and then uh, we also uh, asked for some sort of like, what did you notice? Do you have any other stuff to say? Um, and some of the comments from that are pretty interesting. So I'll, I'll be sharing those uh, a little bit later. Um, we recruited just on social media. We uh, stopped after a thousand people because that was too many um, and uh, just did not specify that we're looking for only native speakers of English. We just specified that we want people comfortable enough in English to take the whole survey. So here are some of the results. Um, so I'm going to break this down one at a time because there's a lot going on in this graph. So first I wanna focus on just the proper name and singular animate antecedents um, because these are uh, things that could be grammatical. And then I have the um, different types of antecedents. So I'm going to start with the case error controls. These are um, using him and there in subject positions. So we expected those to be really ungrammatical. Um, and so these were meant to be ungrammatical controls. Um, and uh, the ratings uh, across everybody were really low. So this was a successful ungrammatical control that gave us kind of an idea of what the floor is of acceptability, what it looks like when something's really ungrammatical. Um, then I wanna look at the, uh, oops, sort of grammatical controls, um, which it's, it's a little bit complicated because of the way that we did antecedents. Um, but these are canonical pronouns, he, she, and they, um, with a singular animate and a proper an, uh, proper name antecedents. Um, the singular animate uh, antecedents were all gender neutral. Uh, they were all stuff like the attorney or the babysitter or these kinds of things. I think actually we wouldn't have included babysitter. I have a list of these somewhere. Um, and so this is basically giving us our ceiling of what it looks like when something is totally normal, grammatical, and fine. Um, notice that the proper name condition is actually a little bit not perfectly at ceiling. This is because um, we're not um, differentiating mismatches between masculine, feminine, and neutral names with the canonical pronouns. So you would get stuff like Benjamin She, and that was lowering the ratings a tiny bit. Um, so I, I'm going to mostly gloss over that, but that's that's the thing that uh, in the follow-up we decided to take out just because there was too much going on. But this is giving us our ceiling. So we have a floor with the case error ungrammatical controls and a ceiling with the, um, the canonical pronouns. And now I wanna focus on the neo pronouns. They're like right in the middle. They are not at floor, they are not at ceiling. They are not totally ungrammatical, if they were totally ungrammatical, they'd be down here with the case error controls. And if they were totally grammatical, if they were fine for everybody, they would be way higher. Um, so we take this as evidence that like, okay, neo pronouns are somewhere in the middle. They are not totally acceptable across the board for people and they're not totally unacceptable. They're somewhere in between. And then I wanted to just sort of compare to the, the plural controls, um, a couple interesting things going on here. Oops. Um, uh, so the ungrammatical case error controls are uh, really bad as expected. Um, and the inanimate antecedents are quite bad with uh, he and she, but kind of maybe okay with they. Um, so there's something interesting going on with they. Um, and then uh, the neo pronouns are weirdly not totally at the floor. And this is something interesting um, where a couple people said in, this, in the comments at the end, huh, I didn't know you could use Z with an inanimate uh, subject. And it was like, interesting. They seem to be taking our survey as instructive. Um, they People people mentioned like, I learned something from taking your survey. I learned about neo pronouns from taking your survey. And now I have decided that because I saw this sentence, that must mean it's okay. Which I think is kind of interesting because it's not something that I've seen in doing research on other types of things, really only about neo pronouns. I, I don't know if you can hear my cat yelling, but he's yelling. He's having a great time. So 
Now looking a little bit at some demographic effects, this is the effect of age on ratings by all these crazy different conditions. This, These conditions, um, the fact that I have this like huge grade of 12 plots is why uh, I simplified the uh, follow-up pretty significantly. Um, but I want to focus particularly on just neopronouns with just proper names and singular animate antecedents. So we're not including the ungrammatical controls here for a sec. Um, and we see that this is on the left, we have younger participants and on the right, we have older participants. We do see that there's an effect of age for both the singular animate noun phrase and a proper name. So younger people are reading neopronouns higher uh, than older people. Um, you'll notice there's also an effect of age um, in the canonical pronouns, it's not as extreme. Um, and there's much less of an effect over here with the singular animate noun phrase. This is because we included singular they. So this is something where previous research on singular they has found kind of repeatedly that younger people rate it higher with a proper name and older people rate it lower with a proper name. This is because of the fact that it's a proper name um, where uh, this is sort of an ongoing language change that hasn't come hasn't reached completion, basically. And so by grouping all the canonical pronouns, he, she, and they together, we're seeing a little bit of the effect of that they. Um, but this is actually a really helpful sanity check. Um, so our case error controls, we do not see any effect of age. Uh, it is not the case that young people just rate everything high. Um, if young people were rating the case error or ungrammatical controls higher, we would need to worry about that in a different way, but it's it's um, not what's happening. Instead, it's just that um, things that are ungrammatical, really ungrammatical, are ungrammatical for everybody. Um, so there's not like a change in, we're just letting whatever happen. Um, it's really that there's something specific going on with neopronouns and maybe also with they. We also looked at um, the participant gender um, so, uh, I am going to, do I have little boxes on this? Yes. I am going to group women and men together for a second because they behaved very similarly to each other. So we had a lot more women and then men, but, um, they very comparably are rating the ungrammatical controls as, uh, as very low. They're rating, um, the ungrammatical controls as very low. So they're you know, rating stuff at the floor when it's ungrammatical, really. And then they're rating he and she quite high, um, and uh, they as well, um, pretty much across the board, and very similarly. Um, notice also that these are he and she are not at ceiling. We think that this is because of that mismatch between names and uh, binary pronouns. So again, we're getting something like Sally and he, and I think that's why men and women are, are rating these a little bit lower. Um, and then looking at how they are reading neopronouns, it's uh, a little bit below the middle. So this is a scale from one to seven. Uh, they're reading stuff around uh, four or a three or even lower. Um, and men and women were really, really similar to each other. Um, on the other hand, looking at everybody who wasn't a man or a woman, uh, so we kind of put everybody who didn't say they were just a man or didn't say they were just a woman. So if people checked man and woman, or if people checked neither man nor woman on the like checkboxes, um, they they got put in this sort of big other category. Um, there's a couple differences. First of all, they are still rating the ungrammatical stuff as really ungrammatical. So that's a relief. It's not the case that non-binary people are just fine with anything. Um, and they are reading the... Um, uh, canonical pronouns actually a little bit higher. They're rating singular they very high, almost at ceiling. And he and she are pretty much at ceiling. Um, again, we get this kind of like long distribution, I think because of some of the mismatches, um, but uh, it's actually higher than men and women are rating them. Um, and with the neo pronouns, they are, do I have a circle on this? Oh, yes, here we go. Uh, they are rating the neo pronouns higher than um, the, the men and the women are. So uh, this is one of the things that I have found when looking at non-binary linguistics in general is that it's not the case that men and women are doing something different from each other. It's that uh, people other than men or women are doing something different, but men and women are about the same. Um, and I think this is kind of important for how we conceptualize when we are doing kind of large experimental um, linguistics and surveys like this of like, 
we had better ask about gender in a way that we can get this information because it keeps being interesting across a number of studies. Um, the other thing is that we asked whether uh, participants identified as LGBT. So um, on the top row here, we have uh, people who are LGBT. And on the bottom row, we have people who are not LGBT. Uh, we did not separate out people into cis or trans and uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, et cetera. Um, so this is, this is sort of a collapse of the whole LGBT umbrella category. Um, but really, I think that the main interesting thing is that, again, the ungrammatical controls are ungrammatical and that the neo pronouns are higher for LGBT participants than for non-LGBT participants. Um, this is also showing that there's a little bit of a different effect of age, which is what I've got on my x-axis here. So LGBT participants are rating neopronouns higher overall, and LGBT participants have a slightly stronger effect of age for neopronouns, meaning that if there were a change going on, LGBT people would be participating in the linguistic change a little faster. Uh, the other thing we looked at is people who use neopronouns as their own pronouns. Um, unsurprisingly, neopronoun users rated neopronouns quite high. So this is how people are rating neopronouns, and here's people who are using neopronouns close to ceiling. Um, whereas um, the other thing that was interesting is that people who are they, them users as their primary pronouns are also rating neopronouns higher, not as much higher, but just a little bit higher. Okay, I'm going to scooch through this pretty quickly, except to say that uh, when we ask people, what did you notice about these sentences? They noticed neopronouns. This is primarily interesting because uh, neopronouns in particular are very, very salient. There's no hiding it from participants when you're doing an acceptability study about neopronouns. They don't, they're not like, maybe this was secretly about, I don't know, clause structure. So uh, it, the neopronouns are super duper salient um, and a lot of people commented on them. Um, I just wanted to sort of share a couple comments here. So um, one person said, I found it easier to accept pronouns that sound like the ones I naturally use, like Z for he. Um, uh, other people said, okay, if the pronoun had a phonetic resemblance to a name, like Fe, or a traditional pronoun, Z is like they in a French accent, which I think is some interesting language ideology. Um, so this is a comment, the kind of comment that we got a lot, actually, um, was that uh, it was it, the particular neo pronouns that were easier were the ones where it was a sort of naturally analogous um, to the, the canonical pronouns that people were already familiar with. So um, getting ready for designing this follow up survey, one of the things that we wanted to do was to change the stimulus design to have fewer experimental conditions, because that was too much. Um, we also wanted to include uh, grammatical and ungrammatical control sentences that weren't pronoun focused to see if that made a big difference. Um, we also included a balanced Latin square design so different that we wouldn't get item effects and we used PC Ibex instead of Qualtrics. Um, and then more importantly, we changed which neo pronouns we were going to look at. So um, one of the things was that Z with a Z and Z with an X were like essentially the same. And so um, we wanted more to have a set of neo pronouns that is looking at um, something that can test whether analogy to existing pronouns is useful. So what we settled on was Z, they, and Thon. Uh, Thon is a sort of an old, an old timey historical neo pronoun, an old neo pronoun sounds funny. Um, that comes from that one. It's like a, a contraction. Um, it is not morphophonologically analogous to any existing canonical pronouns. So we think that this is going to be a useful comparison. And then we did slightly different ways of bidding some of our demographics questions, which you'll kind of see when I start talking very fast about it. Our follow-up um, questions, in addition to the previous questions, we're curious about this analogy question. Um, and uh, we had a number of people say Faye was analogous to they, um, and that Z is analogous to she or he. Um, so this is one of the reasons that we've added in Thon. Um, the other thing that we were curious about was whether there were item order effects, meaning did people rate stuff higher the longer they'd been taking the survey? Were people adapting to neopronouns? So 
just looking at the relative ratings of pronouns, um, this is very similar to what we saw before. Uh, we were just looking at only two antecedent types this time, just proper names and uh, singular definite animate noun phrases. So with proper names and noun phrases, they're pretty comparable, um, where he and she are very close to ceiling, they is a little bit lower, and then the three neo-pronouns are all lower than that. Um, among the neo-pronouns, uh, it looks like Z is better than Fe and Fe is better than Thon. Um, and there's not really a big difference uh, between antecedent types. So it doesn't matter if we're looking at the proper name antecedent or the noun phrase antecedent. Right. So this is kind of um, a little bit maybe an answer to our first question of like, is analogy helpful? Um, the fact that Thon is so much lower than everything else, and it's the one that is not analogous to anything is kind of indicative of like, yes, maybe it's maybe it's because of analogy. Um, the other question that we were interested in was about uh, item order effects. Are people sort of rating stuff higher over time? So when we looked at item order effects, I'm showing just the um, raw item order. We also looked at log item order, um, but it showed basically the same effect. There's no real apparent effect of item order on he or she. So these are these two here where they're just kind of the same across the board. If there is an effect on they, it's very, very slight, but uh, we think that this is pretty close to ceiling. Notice it's very, very slightly lower again in the proper name condition because of the singular they thing. Um, and now looking at they, it's lower, but kind of flat, which we find interesting. Z is a little bit lower, but there is a bit of a slope of people are rating it a little bit higher over time as they go through the survey. And then really dramatically is THON. People are rating THON really low at the beginning of the survey, and they're getting up to a little bit higher at the end of the survey. Um, the thing I wanted to point out, especially about THON um, and with this item order effect, is it's not going up to ceiling. None of these are like the neo pronoun is suddenly fine uh, when I have gotten through the 50 questions. Instead, THON kind of caps out at about the same of where Faye was. So it starts much lower um, at around like rating it of 50 out of 100. And then it starts to sort of evening out at the end of the survey around just over 60, which is kind of where we see Fay. Um, so this is super interesting. Um, I don't have the, the quotes to show you on, on the slide deck, but I will say that a bunch of people explicitly mentioned in their free response comments um, on this survey that they found themselves adapting to Thon over time of the course of the survey. So we found that super interesting. Um, just another effect of age. So we see a slope with they, not with he or she. Um, the proper names for this follow-up study are all plausibly gender neutral. So we are not getting that weird mismatch effect anymore. Um, so we only see the uh, effect of age for they in the proper name condition, much less for the um, noun phrase condition. And then we do see uh, age effects for all three proper, uh, all three neo pronouns, Z, Fe, and Thon here, where Z is a little better, but it's like, um, oh, sorry, this is birth year actually, which means that younger is further to the right, which is the opposite of what I showed for the previous slides, sorry. Um, so it's still continuing in the direction that we would expect a language change to progress in, uh, which is to say younger people are finding this more acceptable. Um, and this is true for all three neo pronouns. Um, LGBT identity, this is something where we actually separated out asking people about their um, sexual orientation uh, separate from their um, gender orientation. So um, when we're uh, asking people if they are LGB plus, uh, this includes cis people and uh, straight trans people would be counting themselves as not LGB plus. We might not do it this way again. Um, it was a little bit of a messy way of doing it. Um, but the, the main interesting thing is that um, uh, queer participants are rating neo pronouns higher across the board um, for Fe, Thon, and C here. Um, and then also very slightly for they, um, where queer participants are rating they completely at ceiling and cishet participants are rating it just slightly below. And then looking at um, people who were identifying themselves as trans, um, we have this like weird neither category of like, people didn't want to categorize themselves as either cis or trans. We think that this is kind of not an 
internally homogenous categories. So they're not really patterning like either cis or trans people. I think that there's something that we need to look at with those participants, but I'm mostly gonna gloss over them. Um, but in general, cis people are rating neo pronouns lower and trans people are rating neo pronouns higher, which is maybe not that surprising. And then finally, I think finally, um, neo pronoun users rate uh, neo pronouns higher. Um, so uh, neo pronoun users here are this like tiny little blue category. It's because we don't have very many of them. Um, and uh, just across the board, they are rating all neo pronouns higher. They're rating Faye basically at ceiling. And they're rating Z very much at ceiling. Thon is a little bit lower, which we find a little bit interesting of like Thon is still a little bit hard for some neo pronoun users. Um, whereas uh, non neo pronoun users are, are rating these lower just across the board. And again, Thon is just consistently the lowest. We are still working on analyzing all the comments that we got from this follow-up study. Um, and so I am not going to do a full analysis of all of that, but I wanted to share a few comments specifically from people who identified themselves as neo-pronoun users. So people who checked like one of the neo-pronouns when we asked what pronouns you use. Um, so one person said, um, I think it's okay that people invent their own pronouns. There's no way that a language can have words for the infinite number of ways it means to exist outside of male and female. I think some more common options outside of they would be good as neo pronouns are trying to do. Another person said, as many ways as feel good for the people that language if it's referring to or, or how many pronouns there should be. My utopia would be a world in which everyone gets to freely choose from a grab bag of gendered and non-gendered language options and to make their own if they don't yet exist. I think many trans people and communities are already doing this. Um, and then another person said, my ideal scenario would be gender and anarchy with open and respectful communication. People would be able to use a variety of pronouns and those pronouns would not have so much weight and strict definitions required uh, attached to them. Um, so these are all um, comments specifically coming from people whose neo pronouns, whose pronouns are neo pronouns um, at the end of this survey. All right, um, the interviews, this is actually just sort of a promissory part. So. Um, one of the things that I've been desperately curious about is how do people use neo pronouns in natural conversation contexts? I have anic data, but I don't have anybody doing it in front of my, you know, tape recorder. So I want to know: Do people pause, self self correct, or present other disfluencies? Um, do people notice if they unintentionally use an incorrect pronoun for somebody? If they do use the correct pronouns, do they? mostly use ones that are aligned with the person's assigned sex at birth? Do they default today? What's going on there? I want to know also how do relationships between people affect the pronouns that they use? Um, and how do neo-pronoun users conceptualize the relationship between pronouns and identity? And do people's social attitudes about gender, language, and transness relate to how they use neo-pronouns in a conversation? Um, I uh, will tell you what, how, what we are doing, and this is what we are going to be just in total marathon mode all summer about. We are doing snowball recruitment where we recruit people in pairs. Um, we first recruit a neo pronoun user and interview them, and then they recommend a um, buddy, which can be a friend or a family or a, mem a family member or a coworker, just anybody. Um, and uh, then we uh, interview the buddy separately. Um, and both interviews involve talking about the study buddy um, so that we have some third person reference basically. Um, it's a two part study where the first part is a semi-structured interview where we're talking about language and identity and gender. And the second part is a um, written survey or, well, it's it's um, internet um, so that we have spreadsheets with demographic info and attitudes about gender essentialism, trans identities, and ling linguistic prescriptive itself. I don't have any results yet. I just wanted to tell you about my cool thing that's not done yet. So I really want to be able to share more soon, but that's a work in progress. So I wanna move on to what does all this mean? So I think some of the big takeaways so far, first, neopronouns are not as ungrammatical uh, as, uh, they're not ungrammatical, but they're definitely not being rated as totally natural. Um, they're neither at floor nor at ceiling. Um, and the exception seems to be people who use neopronouns themselves, which is a very small number of people. There's also no real dif consistent differences between uh, antecedent types, and this is different from singular they. So this is really interesting to us in that um, uh, this seems to be, if there is a language change going on, which we're not quite sure yet, 
Um, it is a separate one from the one going on with singular they, which is really particular to the type of antecedent, um, where proper names and definite noun phrases are really different. Um, but the social demographic variables uh, that are correlated with acceptability of neopronouns are similar to the uh, ones that we see uh, correlated with singular they. So there's age, gender, gender orientation of our use of social trans, and then LGBT identity in general. Um, and then there's some continuing repeating themes in metalinguistic commentary about neopronouns. They are very salient and people have explicit and conscious strategies about using morphological analogy and people have strong feelings about the right way to do non-binary language, which I want to expand on in a moment. Um, as a syntactician, one of the things I'm very curious about is what do we do with this gradient acceptability. So what does it mean when people are consistently rating something as not fine and not bad? Is it a part of their mental grammar? Um, this is something that I don't think is decided yet, but there's a few po logical possibilities. One is that mm, my mental grammar produces this, but third factor stuff like this is unfamiliar, this is sociopolitically unpleasant to me. I don't know anybody who does this. These are all things that interfere with acceptability that don't have to do with grammaticality. Um, another possibility is the grammar doesn't already produce this, but it can be coerced to. You can learn it. It's plausible under the grammar, but it's not already familiar. I think that that is something that I'm really interested in exploring what um, adult L1 acquisition is like, of like people continue acquiring their own L1 throughout the entire length of their lives. And I think that I'm really excited about looking at lifespan change in the future. Um, the other possibility is that the grammar just doesn't produce this for some people, but there's some sort of social desirability bias that is making people rate it higher than they really mean it. That's really hard to pick apart. And I think that we need some sort of more social psychology involvement in, in um, picking that apart to see if that's what's going on. Um, the other thing is that we found a bunch of interspeaker variations. So there are some speakers who are mostly fine with neopronouns, like neopronoun users, um, and younger people, trans people, and queer people across the board. Um, this is consistent with kind of what we expected because these are very linked to the kinds of identities that are getting exposed to and talking about and desiring neopronouns. Um, I think it's sort of an open question about whether the, the age effects that we have found are an apparent time difference, meaning is this an indicative of an ongoing language change? We don't have any longitudinal work, and I don't think we have quite enough research to say for sure, but... Um, uh, there, there's sort of uh, uh, two things. One is that metalinguistic comments, people keep saying these have been around for ages. I've been aware of them for a while. I just don't use them. Um, and being aware of a form is not the same thing as using a form. And so I think that that's something that we need to think about when we think about what language change does and is and how it gets started. Um, and then the other thing that's really exciting to me is that these metalinguistic comments tell us what's important to people. So for neopronoun users, uh, the themes that come up are self-expression, self-determination, creativity, and freedom from restrictive categories. For people who are not neopronoun users, a lot of the repeating themes are, what is the optimal, most efficient way to deal with this? Like, it's a problem-solving mode. The other theme that comes up is about difficulty in remembering or learning pronouns. Um, and a, another theme that we see a lot is, I would use them if somebody asked me to, but nobody has asked me to. So I'm curious to see where that goes. So big picture stuff. Um, queer language is a source of freedom, creativity, and play. This is super important. Language changes that have originated in the queer community, and I use definite specific singular they as an example, carry really heavy uh, indexical baggage and they get politicized. The current political context in the US right now that we're kind of dealing with, and this is not specific to the US at all, is that reactionary right-wing movements have involved stuff like state legislatures attempting and sometimes succeeding to make certain pronouns illegal in certain contexts, which is wild. Um, I, I have an example on the next slide. But uh, what we're seeing over and over again is that a particularly in English speaking context, pronouns are a symbol of larger sociopolitical fights and they represent transness in a, in a particular way. The, the sort of um, insult of like, you look like you have pronouns is, is something that is like, what? 
So what it means is you look trans. Um, it's it's very explicitly like the concept of pronouns is linked to the concept of transness. This is a recent case that I um, am aware of in part because I uh, had a, a brief meeting with the lawyers who are uh, defending or, or, or working on this case. But um, in this instance, this is a case where the Florida state legislature passed a law. This is the law in Florida banning primary and secondary school teachers from introducing themselves in their accurate names and pronouns. Um, and a particular school board attempted to fire a trans woman for using her name. Uh, and pronouns. Uh, the good news is that literally just last week, the federal judge who was hearing the court issued an injunction to be like, no, you can't fire her for that. Um, and uh, the the judge um, Walker, I believe, uh, cited that um, it's it's about uh, expression, self expression, and self celebration. Um, uh, in sharing her preferred title and pronouns, Ms. Wood celebrates herself and sings herself, um, not in a disruptive or coercive way, but in a way that subtly vindicates her identity, her dignity, and her humanity. I think that this is really important, and I think that the next few years of watching how case law proceeds as some of these laws get challenged in court would be a, a rich vein of uh, metalinguistic commentary about pronouns. But what this means is that I am very concerned with the social responsibility of linguists. And I have here a quote from uh, my uh, late friend, John Henner. How you language is beautiful. Don't let anyone tell you that your language is wrong. Your languaging is the story of your life. Um, sorry. <laughs> I think linguists have an ethical responsibility to fight to protect minoritized ways of languaging and to fight against attempts to use language to perpetuate structural harms. And trans ways of languaging are under constant attack because they are a proxy for trans people and trans liberation. And so I think that this is just something that we all need to think about all the time and worry about. There's also a lot of work to be done. This is a very new field. Um, I'm really, really excited to be doing interviews because we know essentially nothing about how neopronouns happen in spoken conversation. I want us to be exploring the relationship between gender essentialist, trans affirming and prescriptivist language attitudes. Um, I also want more work on um, trans and non-binary languaging happening in languages that aren't English, French, German, and Spanish. Um, I uh, I have been sort of hampered by my own monolingualism, and uh, I am putting out just the general call of uh, if you're working on this, uh, I want to support or collaborate with you. Um, tell me how I can make that work happen. Um, and sort of finally, I think that this is uh, the future work is the future work section is important in part because taking queer and trans language seriously makes it a safer and better world for queer and trans linguists, both in and outside of the academy. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little over time. Um, but I have a slide because I want to write down questions uh, as people share them. Hello, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Right. Uh, so I wanted to ask something about language change. Language change mm. can happen in a wider or more narrow way, but in case of near pronouns, you can see them being used on a single person's level. And I was just curious about that, if that is something separate from the wider language change. Yeah, this is something that I have found really exciting and interesting about trans uh, languaging in general is that um, a single person can change the way that they language over the course of their life. And um, in the case of, for example, pronouns, gendered pronouns in uh, languages like English, um, one of the things that happens is that when a person says, okay, I'm using new pronouns now, everybody around them has to now make a decision of like, am I going to change the way that I'm doing language? Um, and so I think that um, this has been something that is really interesting to watch because I think it has given us two insights. And this is some coming from more of my research on Singular Day. 
One insight is that pronouns in languages like English, where they are uh, mostly a closed category and a functional category, are harder and slower to change than something like a name or nouns. And so people will start using new names and nouns for a person faster than they'll start using the person's new pronouns. Um, that's something that uh, tells us something about the way that structure, the structure of language works in the brain. It's a really interesting case study. And I think that the other thing is that it tells us that um, lifespan change is, uh, is possible, that people continue rearranging their grammar over the entire course of their adult lives. It's not the case that you become you know, you get out of the critical period and then your grammar is totally set and you never change anything in your grammar again, people are rearranging and changing their grammar over their lifespan. Um, and so I think that in this way, like trans people are a really cool case study uh, uh, that lets us learn more about how language works in the brain. And I find it really delightful. Thank you. That's a great question. Oh, um, uh, and do you think this little uh, changes just for one person, from one person, does affect a societal change? Do you think That's such a we big... should categorize them differently? It's such a big question. Um, I think that this Sorry. is something that, that it's it's totally fine. I love the question and I love the big philosophical questions that, that are related to this. Um, language change has to come from somewhere. This is what sort of um, the sociolinguistic concept of the actuation problem, I'm going to write down actuation problem, of where does language change come from? Um, and how does it get kicked off? Why do we go from maybe something where there's stable variation for a while to something where there is change? Um, and there's been some interesting research from sociolinguists uh, like Bill LeBov, um, looking at um, a few people who are hyper innovators, who are socially very um, prolific people can diffuse an individual change very, very quickly. And I think that um, trans and queer people are, are frequently the hyper innovators that Lebov is talking about. Um, and so the question of whether an individual change turns into a community change is a little bit of a question of who is that person in contact with and are they having an effect on the people around them? So it's a question about social connectedness and social mirroring. And, and it, it starts, if something starts with one person, it only goes beyond them when it goes to their immediate contacts and has to diffuse out from there. Um, so, so yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your, your very big philosophical sociolinguistics question, but I hope it's, something to to um, contemplate. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much for this lecture. Thank you, thank you so much, yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Absolutely, um, please. Yeah, okay, I wanted to ask a question about, uh, so you talked about like doing research in other languages uh, about mm -hmm. your pronouns. I wanted to ask if, is, is there any way to implement this to languages that has um, gender neutral pronouns, like it just doesn't associate gender with pronouns at all. Um, for example, Turkish is one of them. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder if like, um, I mean, even though it's all gender neutral, could there be like neo pronouns, like maybe the gender neutral pronoun is the common pronoun and uh, the canon one, as you have coined it, and then the, mm -hmm. the, we have alternative pronouns for just gender euphoria and creativity. It's kind of utopic, but you know, maybe. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really into that concept. Yeah. I think that um, in general, the, the, this is something where I think we, I, I think about pronouns, uh, Pronouns are an epiphenomenon. Like pronouns are not cross-linguistically a single sort of grammatical category. But um, I have been thinking about English pronouns, especially the gender marking ones, as essentially a type of honorific, um, where it's it's marking a kind of social relationship. Um, there are a lot of the world, the majority of the world's languages do not mark gender on pronouns. Like English is, is um, in the minority by doing this. It just happens to be that English is like this colonial world power language. Um, and so it, it sort of gives the impression of um, being very popular. But in languages 
and situations where the pronouns are not showing the social relationship of gender, where I expect the interesting queer and trans languaging to be happening is somewhere else in the grammar. Um, I don't think that it's impossible, sort of what you're thinking about of like neo pronouns that are more expressive and sort of on top of like a, a sort of gender neutral unmarked pronoun that we use for everybody. Also, we have some fun pronouns for if you want to have fun. I think that that's totally possible, but I think I would not expect it to happen unless people felt a strong social need for that, um, that they couldn't fulfill in other ways. And so I think that that's where one of those pressures comes from of like, why do people feel the need to coin neo pronouns? A lot of the sort of description of why people coin neo pronouns in English is because they are trying to meet a need that they feel they can't fulfill in another way. Um, and so I, I only expect this to happen in a language like Turkish if there's a need that's not being met. Um, and uh, I uh, also would say that this is something where I just want to hear more from trans and non-binary people in Turkish speaking communities, like what's everybody up to? Um, because that's that's where the interesting stuff comes from is people are already doing something and it might not be pronouns. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love that question. Thank you. Um, I guess there are no other questions, or are there? Oh, people are thanking you in the chat. Uh, and I really appreciate also, it. Thank you. I want to thank you again for coming here and uh, doing this amazing presentation, especially the quote and the, uh, the end. Uh, Sorry, oh, I cried. Very <laughs> emotional. <laughs> I'm putting that back on same, the slide. Yeah, same. I just want to look at it. Like, <laughs> this is yeah. beautiful. And it did inspire me a lot to make research about uh, pronouns and other stuff in Turkish as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Please keep me updated. I want to hear from what everybody's up to. And thank you so much for inviting me. Yay. Yes. Thank you so much.